build packing, the uh, S786 packing. So I'm quite concerned about that. And they said, well, we really need someone in the area over there to distribute these postcards. And they're in the back, and feel free to get a postcard, fill it out. I'll mail it, or you can mail it. And these postcards are just saying that we're against the, the fracking coming to North Carolina. And uh, it goes to um, Pat McCurry's office, NC Legislators, NC Mining and Energy Commission. And basically it says, um, fracking is a controversial process used in drilling for natural gas that has been linked to contaminated drinking water, food and air, and secret toxic chemicals. So I volunteered to do this presentation for the conservation group and to get the word out and to try to reach the public to urge them to please sign these and send this back in. That's why I'm here today. Um, another article I read was from Nathaniel Axtell. He's a new staff writer in Blue Ridge. Um, and the biggest thing that kind of jumped out to me was the fact that the North Carolina Geological Survey has spent three decades determining whether there are potential organic rich formations across the state. Kitzer says that one of those areas happens to be in the far western reaches of North Carolina. As early as August, Kritzer said state geologists could begin collecting rocks along state right of ways in Clay, Cherokee, Graham, Haywood, Jackson, Macon, and Swain counties, in areas where they feel the potential uh, is for this organic rich formation. So I felt a real urgency to go ahead and, as a concerned citizen, to try to re out reach out to the public and maybe give some information that some people do not have about uh, fracking. Fracking is controversial and dangerous, and I'm worried about its potential to do real damage to North Carolina landowners and communities. Uh, fracking and shale gas development in other states has caused groundwater contamination, high water consumption, animal death, toxic air pollution, heavy truck and traffic congestion, and health problems for neighbors. Fracking also uses one to six million gallons of water each time a gas well is fracked, which could be a devastating draw on state water <coughs> supplies in an era of worsening droughts. Fracking produces huge volumes of wastewater containing cancer-causing chemicals, and North Carolina has no capacity for safe disposal. The fracking process can pollute the air with toxic air pollution that can cause cancer, harm the development of children from before birth through adolescence, and give people of all ages respiratory problems. Um, one component of fracking that concerns me is that the companies drilling on land right next to mine can keep the chemical formula for their fracking fluid a secret. And from the public, including me, I think North Carolina citizens have a right to know what chemicals are being injected underground, and especially since a single mistake by a driller can put those chemicals into our groundwater supply. So I'm just going to stop there. And um, Michelle Allen of the Conservation Group in Raleigh has kindly sent me a PowerPoint to guide me along. So I thought that we would try that. And um, let's see. I'm just going to see if one of the ladies can come back in. Karen, what was the name of the group again in Raleigh? Um, it is under the heading of um, uh, www.conservationnetwork.org. Also, I have information from Sally Morgan, which is Energy and Water Justice Researcher, Organizer, Clean Water for North Carolina. Okay, it's www.cwf nc.org and you can get this information later if you like um, there's a lot on these websites if you want to research it more and to look into um, signing a petition 
you know, becoming a part of the um, the public against this fracking. But they have to be. You have to be heard, and the postcards are part of that way of being heard. I'll just continue on until we get this going. The NC legislator voted to make it a crime for those who access to fracking chemical mix doctors, first responders to disclose the chemicals to others. That's just wrong. So if you are near a fracking drill and you are exposed, um, they really don't have any. They really don't have to tell you what that chemical is used. So I don't know how you're supposed to be treated. Um, no state is a model that shows fracking can be done safely. Studies in Pennsylvania and Arkansas have found repeated environmental violations with ineffective enforcement, reflecting the massive financial and political pressure the industry brings to bear on regulators. North Carolina does not need to open the door to this industry at a time when there are still many questions about the process and the impacts on our communities. The coal ash spill on the Dan River this year showed us that weak environmental protections and poor implementation can devastate a local community. Fracking will leave the state dotted with similar toxic wastewater pool ponds, and it's only a matter of time before that pollution leaks into our rivers and lakes. Current legislative leadership seems willing to move mountains for the oil and gas industry, but continues to fight solar companies who are already operating and quickly growing in North Carolina. I think there is a, there is another source that we can go to other than the natural gas extraction. There are currently 137 solar companies that work in North Carolina, employing 3,100 people. If the gas industry comes to NC, it is projected to create a be, at best a few hundred jobs, and many would go to contractors from North Dakota, Arkansas, or Texas. Lawmakers have broken the promise they made in 2012 and again in 2013 to have the finished package of fracking rules in front of them before deciding whether to allow fracking in North Carolina. In signing the bill, Governor McCrory has signaled his willingness to put North Carolinians' public health and communities at risk. Can I make a suggestion? Yes, ma'am. Frankly, I'm, I'm disappointed that so few people are here, and we've got a stack of postcards. Yes, ma'am. I would like to suggest that everybody take a handful oh, that and right. kind of canvas your neighborhood as best you can and give them just to as many people as you can think of because I'd like for this information to be more widely disseminated than those just here. Exactly, and, and that's why me as a, a not, I'm not an expert, um, but I'm able to read and I'm able to touch base with conservation groups that are experts. Um, and, and I think that's what's important is taking those postcards and saying no to the fracking and that is fine. They sent me 500. They have 10,000 printed. They would be more than happy to send as many as you like. Um, they're very interested in stopping this right now. So. Okay. So Okay, now we're back on. So we'll start with the PowerPoint. Um, this PowerPoint is from Michelle Allen, public action organizer from Raleigh, Durham. And um, why fracking is wrong for North Carolina. Compulsory forced pooling. I was not familiar with that term at all. I, I mean, I, I've known about fracking for several years now, but that particular term I was not familiar with. And I don't think a lot of people are familiar with some of these terms that are on the bill. Groundwater contamination, toxic air emissions, the industry is keeping fracking chemicals secret and doesn't make economic sense. Okay. What the bill says, the S786 calls for more studies to be done on forced pooling. Safer, alternative, um, banned forced pooling, that's one of them. Yes, I have a, um, 
I'm going to pull that up right now. Oh, good. Yeah. that we need to get right is the issue of force pooling. Now, in order for us to really be clear about what force pooling is and how it plays out for our state, we really need to understand where it comes from, what the concepts are that created force pooling, and then how it plays out in shale gas extraction. So, let's take a location. And, and here there's a community. sitting on oil. So she puts a well in the backyard. Well, whatever comes out of that well, that belongs to Betty. No matter where in this reservoir it comes from. And that's a legal concept called the rule of capture. Whoever puts their straw in Whatever comes out of that straw is theirs. Well, now Charlie and Diane, they find out about this too. So they have an option they can put in their own straws. But that gets kind of messy and everybody's drawn from the same reservoir. And, and, and also it has a really, a, a fairly large environmental impact. So instead of doing that, What Charlie and Diane are going to do is they're going to come over here and talk to Betty because she's already got a well going. They're going to say, we're going to help offset the cost of that well, so we will contribute money to here, and we'll share what comes out of it. And this is called pooling. And now everyone's happy. There's less environmental impact. They're all getting the resource, and they're sharing the cost. Well, except for Al over here. Let's say Al's asleep, or Al doesn't talk to his neighbors, or Al doesn't know what's going on, or Al doesn't, doesn't, just doesn't like to work with people. For whatever reason, Al over here doesn't want to be a part of the pool. But the point here is that Betty and Charlie and Diane can't take their resource out of this pool without also taking Al's. There's no way for them to just take one without taking the other. They're not going after it. It's coming to them. So even though Al, maybe he doesn't want to do this because he doesn't think that the price is right yet, if he waits a few years, the price will be better, but he doesn't really have that option because if he tries to wait, because Betty, Charlie, and Diane are pulling theirs out, he's going to lose his. And what we've said over time is it's not fair for somebody who owns part of a resource to lose it just because they're not in the pool. And so what we've created is a situation that draws Al into the pool, whether he likes it or not, for his own good. And that is called forced pooling. So forced pooling was created to 
protect the rights of landowners who might lose a resource that they otherwise would want to take advantage of. But this is a very different situation than the situation that we have in North Carolina. In our case, it's not a big reservoir. That resource is trapped in the rock. Why it's called shale gas. It's trapped in a particular type of shale. So now, when Betty sticks in her straw, instead of pulling from the whole resource, what Betty gets is this little bit here. Well, that doesn't work. So Betty goes back and takes, in order to break up this rock and release the gas, a liquid is pumped down in. And that liquid, under very high pressure, is used to crack this rock, to break it up. And now, instead of just pulling from there, Betty's pulling from here. And because it is a liquid being used to break up, it is called hydraulic fracture. So not only, does this, not only does this go straight down, but Betty can also run a horizontal line. So now she's able to break up the rock all through here and release that gas. So now, when Charlie and Diane want to pull, what they basically say is, let us simply run this line on a cross, and we'll draw all of this in. And, and that's, very, that's much more efficient for them. They can give money into the cost here, and they get money back. And it draws from all across the resource. But now notice, the resource is not coming to the well. The well is going to the resource. Now let's talk about Al. Instead of the fact that Al would, instead of it being that Al would lose his resource, that resource is no longer that mobile. And sure, there is some movement in the rock when, when fracking takes place. There's some movement from outside of the frack zone. But, you know, if there was that much movement, you wouldn't need fracking in, to begin with. If there was a lot of movement, you wouldn't need to break up the rock to begin with. So now the question is a very different one. It's not about Al losing a resource that he might not know about. It's not about Al losing a resource that he might want to wait for. It is the fact that Betty and Charlie and Diane recognize that it is more cost efficient with one well to cover more territory. So it would help the efficiency and the cost to be able to run that other line out this way. And that's really what we're talking about in terms of this type of a resource and the shale gas that we've got here in North Carolina. Well, there's another issue here. Now, let's pretend for a moment that instead of Al, let's say it's Charlie who doesn't want to sell his. So he says, no, you cannot run this line across my property. Well, now Diane is out here, and she's got Charlie in between. Ch Diane wants to join with Betty and Al in a pool. But in order for Diane to join, she's got to bring Charlie in as well. Now, Diane could put in a well of her own, but that's not cost efficient. There might be people or something else on the other side, but that may not work either. But here we have, in order for Diane to sell her gas, Charlie, it's not just that they have to get access across the land, but Charlie has to sell his gas too. So the question that we're really wrestling with is, what is the role of government in this? Should the government come in and compel Charlie to sell his gas so that Diane can sell hers? Or even so that Diane and Betty and Al can sell all of theirs? Because we have to acknowledge that if you don't have the cost effectiveness of the, of the entire pool, it may not be cost effective. It may not be cost effective to extract. And it doesn't mean that they lose it. They just lose it at that time and at that price point. And different states have done different things with this. Some states have said, no, it's not okay. 
Some states have said, well, there are geographic locations. They also say, well, you know, there has to be a certain percentage of this, of this resource that is already being spoken for before you can compel the rest. And that's one of the, the critical issues. But why should Charlie lose the right to determine what happens with his land and be forced to cover the cost as well as the getting the return for the extraction from the others so that this can, they can be, their, their resource can be extracted in a cost-effective way. And that's what we're really boiling down to here. Is should the government compel someone to sell something that they don't want to sell so that others can sell theirs in a more cost-effective way? Thanks. I'm going to go ahead and pull up the other PowerPoint. Um, primarily, it follows this really well. Um, and this is also from the, um, a landowner, um, Sharon Marks, a landowner. Well, when read at that time, it's naturally increased since we signed our lease as people became more informed as to what the gas companies are actually here for. And, you know, I don't begrudge anybody who can get a better contract than what I did. I mean, I went with a local lawyer who was very good with contracts, but at the time, all of this was still so new that they even missed things, which... I have felt have come back to bite me. So again, you know, get somebody that you are, you know, it's very reputable if you're considering signing a lease. So we signed that lease. Like I said, we were given $100 an acre. So being farming as what it is, we took it to the bank. I mean, that was $19,000. Caught up on some bills, paid off some loans. It was like winning the lottery. It didn't expect it to be long term. And they came in here in August 2008 and drilled the well. So we went through the process of the drilling, which took approximately eight weeks, then the fracking. And in March of 2009, you can see the damages that runs through the woods up through there, crossing our fields, crossing other neighbors' properties. The pipeline went in. That brings with it its own set of problems that you really should need to be aware of. Um, when you sign, well, when we signed the lease, we were told it was for a 30-foot right-of-way. They do not tell you that they clear cock between 100 and 150 feet. So that permanently destroys a lot of woodland, a lot of natural habitats. Uh, they do reclaim it, but again, this is something that you need to have an explicit black and white in your contract because their processes of reclaiming do not usually follow the conservation practices that have been established, even if you have them in record down at the, well, for us, it's in White Sox. They sit there and they tell you, prove it. So you have your numerous trips down to get your conservation plans and you get some very helpful conservation officers who will come out and tell these people that an alfalfa plant field cannot be replaced with a conservation contractor's mix simply because it's fast growing. We went online as far as production in April 2009. Uh, there's still continuous traffic in and out with trucks, maintenance, work crews, service crews. And June of 2010, uh, set of these servicemen were out there working. To this day, I can only tell you that from, through Chesapeake, that they were doing maintenance work. Within days, our water changed. We went from having water that did seem out of the norm to drawing Alka-Seltzer out of your faucet. 
And so we called Chesapeake, and they came in, and a little air monitor sent off all these bells and whistles within three to five seconds, and he determined that we had an excessive level of methane. DEP tested that two weeks later. It measured at 56.3 milligrams per liter. DEP also told me that over three, you should have a vent system and a monitor in your house. Our vent system did not get installed until December, and Chesapeake has never brought us a monitor. So I have strategically left windows open in my house for a constant air well, for over a year now, even through the winter, because I'm afraid of the buildup of methane. We are at a high explosive level. But we have gotten very good at taking very short showers. We're usually within under five minutes, because if you're in the shower longer than that, you do get a dizzy, lightheaded feeling. But nobody can explain why. I can often hold a standard kitchen match to my water and like I said, it is unpredictable, but the methane randomly travels with the water, and sometimes it will light quite spectacularly. Just like that. Now, Chesapeake is going to say, well, there's natural occurring methane in the wells already. What do you have? What do you, what's your reply to, to a comment like that? My reply is that their post fracking test, their own, the methane tested 0 0.01 milligrams per liter. And since July of um, 2010, it has tested as high as 64 milligrams. So obviously something has changed. And usually you can mess it. They say as long as it aerates, it stays to drink. And usually you can see a little bit of um, gas just aerating out of there. I really can see it now. I'm going to get the water to my issue with Chesapeake right now is independent water tests have shown that there is other contaminants in that water, but DEP and Chesapeake only seem to be concerned with the high levels of methane. We discovered back in November, because at that point we were boarding my daughter-in-law's horses, the water won't freeze. So, but nobody has determined what chemical cocktail is the cause of it. A uh, local water company brings me 25 of those blue five gallon jugs once a month. And because it, without admitting that they were at the cause for this, they did not feel it was necessary to provide water to any of my animals. So therefore, I no longer have any animals in the barn. Uh, what animals we do have, we have a herd of 18 beef animals that are in the pasture across the road because that way they have access to a spring fed source because the methane does seem to be a migratory problem. But again, Chesapeake won't admit that they had anything to do with it. We used to have, you know, like I said, dairy animals, we had hogs, we had my daughter-in-law's horses, the cats and the dogs, and I don't let any of them drink the water. So you've got this uh, compressor back there with an access road that's being used by the gas company almost a weekly basis? Oh, daily. Daily basis, and you didn't sign on for any of this? Well, when we agreed to the access road being here, we were all given the impression that they were temporary. Again, this is a term I've learned that the gas company uses very vaguely. Temporary for me is not temporary for them. They're very friendly because they want something from you. They want your property. And they are willing to bend over backwards and answer what appears to be any of your questions. 
And I'm here today to tell you that for every question you think they answer, because I won't say the gas company will lie to you, but I'll tell you they withhold information. And they're not as upfront as they appear to be. Three, you can. Yeah. Well, I can see the red right there. I'll put that in black and white. I'd love to send a copy of that to my representatives. Does the methane be burned there, or does the methane just coming out? I believe the methane is coming out, but you really need to ask them there. Uh, so I don't know about us. This is not my land. The biggest thing is the amount of water that is used just in the fracking process and then the rest of the gas extraction and what that feedback does to our water supply. That's a huge concern and should be looked at. I mean, this, is, this is the collective good. This is the commonwealth. This is you know where people should be watching for each other, not just you know, monetary, monetary. I just think it looks like it's a little more pervasive than I thought. You know, there's a lot of hidden wells. You can't see from the roads. If you're, if you're real discriminating, you can see some, some rises in the land. The more they put pads in, but I think it's in a lot more nooks and crannies than I previously thought. Hey. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go back to the PowerPoint. Um, I'm going to go split a state, you do not have the rights of minerals underneath your, you own the top of the land, everything else is owned by the industry. And I don't think it's like that here, you've got to, you've got to lease your property, but that's another issue, another side issue, is what you really do own and what. So out west, they can just come in basically against your will. Well, sir, so I'm, I'm a real estate broker, mm -hmm. uh, and unless the law has changed very recently, when you buy a piece of property, your property rights in North Carolina go from your boundary to the center of the earth. So you do own the mineral rights? Yes. The, in all cases? In all uh, cases. Because we were looking, at, when we first moved up here, we were looking at a piece of property over west of here. And there had been some mica mining there before. And one of the things that the agent told us was that that minimal right exclusion was still there. Yeah, and that's, yes, okay, excuse me. I said in all cases. Now, if a company has owned that property before, mm -hmm. and they have held the mineral rights, then that's different. That's something you need to look into with each, mm -hmm. each of your properties. For the most part, that's not the way it is. All right? Uh, May, may let's, take, let's take uh, Mark over here, Mark Crawford. He owns a piece of property up in uh, Cartoon J. And I know there's been no mineral rights on that property. He owns that property from his boundary lines all the way to the center of the earth. How would we find out if our property that we bought here... It would have been... Had, it would have had to have been... Uh, Disclosed to you at the uh, at the, uh, before you you settled before you uh, closed. closed. And, and I'd like to add to that. Um, in the back of the room, there is a stack of papers, and they're stapled together. And it's what's wrong with the S seven eighty six bill. And if you'll read, and you can take one with you if you like, along with the postcards. But what it says is compulsory pooling that this bill does not address the risks that matter most. So compulsory pooling is when a natural gas driller can force a landowner to allow development of their mineral estate against their will. Exactly. And the Act punts on this issue asking for more studies where it should have explicitly prohibited uh, compulsory pooling. Uh, 
of unleashed shale gas interest. Also, another thing I'd like to point out from this, this uh, and you're welcome to pick up a packet so you can read it at home and, and discuss it with your family and friends. Um, this bill uh, basically says there's no there's no plan for the wastewater um, disposal. Also, um, fracking creates high volumes of polluted wastewater. Even if some is reused, most will eventually need to be disposed of. It cannot safely be injected underground in North Carolina. North Carolina lacks both pre-treatment and discharge standards for many of the hundreds of contaminants that can be found in fracking wastewater. And the state is making no effort to establish them. Under the draft, fracking rules a facility could be permitted to treat and discharge fracking waste to surface waters without removing contaminants that threaten public health. So this is something that, that I would suggest uh, everyone taking with them. And this is from the conservation group, and this is about the bill. So. Right. Just, just to clarify, the bill is not a law. I believe it's called the Energy Modernization Act. Yes. So it's no longer just a bill, it's a law. Right, exactly. So, <coughs> I'm sorry, I didn't read the whole thing. Let me just add to this, uh, mm -hmm. that the law currently makes it a crime to disclose the chemicals used in fracking. They will tell you that this is a trade secret. I'm reading, I'm reading from a letter to the editor by Doug Woodward, who lives in Macon County. Yes. And he's researched this. It's a crime to dispose of the chemicals. It's also the law through Section 14 has silenced your voice by making it illegal for any county, town, or other local entity to prohibit fracking. Exactly. Okay. Yes, that is an instance um, in here. The act mandates that when a company says information such as the chemical formula of its fracking fluid is a trade secret. The last thing that you need to know, legislators who so badly want fracking to begin, and those with a monetary interest in the industry, will talk to you about energy independence when in actuality they want to build an export terminal on the North Carolina coast to sell liquid natural gas abroad and $20,000 from NC taxpayer money has been used by the Department of Natural Resources to market North Carolina's natural gas overseas. I have a question that is from what I've been seeing, I thought it was still a bill and not yet law. So I appreciate the clarification. Mm -hmm. And what you just said about the, our hands being tied and there's nothing we can do about it. Well, yeah, we don't have any way to say we, you know, we don't want this here. Is there any possibility that that being the case that we can't use the, the recent finding in New York State that they rule that you know each community has a, has a right to say no. Is it too late for us to bring that in? No, it's not. I don't think so, but I would guess that's a very good question. And I think um, asking the conservation group or Sally Morgan that is with um, uh, Energy and Water Justice, researchers, organizers, clean water for North Carolina would be a good question. Yeah, I was going to go ahead and correct you, but I didn't, you know, as an individual, I didn't really have the clout to, to bring them in and say, help us here. Well, I and, want and to. that's where, uh, that's when I started this um, recent uh, project, is just to enlighten people in this area and to be a facilitator for the postcards and to have this presentation. And, um, and I think that it's the beginning of the public coming out and speaking out and sending these postcards to the governor and the NC and, and legislatures uh, that we are, we are not going to stand for this, that we do not want fracking in North Carolina. So, um, go ahead. Just to, to address your point, what you can do, you know that the town of Webster and Jackson County and Bryson City, those two towns have already done resolutions against fracking. Even though they're not supposed to, they don't have the, the, the legal basis of doing this, they have gone ahead and gone on record and said that they are against fracking in their Right, and I Macon County, yeah. and the Macon County commissioners, I think, are saying, "Well, we need to study it more," and that's what they always tell you that they need to study it more. I, I, I saw a recent video with Bob Scott, and he was uh, talking at the League of Women Voters, and he did say that they were working on that, that they were going to have a meeting 
to bring together a resolution to try to prevent uh, anyone coming into this area. So I think it is on the board, and I think anything. Is there anything short of a lawsuit? I will overturn the existing law. You know, it needs to be legally Or changing the legislature. It needs to be changing the legislature. I imagine Southern Environmental Law in Asheville is doing that now. But my husband's ruled in front of the commissioners last week, Doug. And I think what we all can do is if you go online, what um, Karen has brought forth is wonderful. It's each individual. Educate yourself as well as you can first. Not just um, look at both points of view so that you know how to counter the other views that say, like Senator Davis, who lives right here, who says it's safe, he co-sponsored the bill. Know their arguments, be prepared to counteract. Um, so what I'm saying is get more educated, and I thank Karen for doing this. She's just one of us who's taken this on to spread the word. So. Get educated before you do anything else. Go online. There's this group. There's um, North Carolina Against Fracking. There's this P. Uh, what PD, uh, dot org is it? I'm not sure. I'm not it's sure. great. It's, that. it's about a six-minute video on it. And um, New York Times, all sorts of resources. So go take some time. Then write letters to the local commissioners, handwritten to Senator Davis. Um, there's just so much you can do. And the other the other problem though is that there are three states like this Pennsylvania, uh, Texas I think I can't Arkansas. remember the third one that had lawsuits up and, and and went to the EPA and they were in the process of investigating this enormous groundwater contamination from all the fracking injection that even contains radioactivity and the EPA shut down those investigations. I don't know how many at least ten times I've signed things online to the EPA to reopen these investigations. Like they were illegally shut down, yeah. the investigations, but that's how much pop this industry has. Well, there's, there's another issue in play, and it goes way, way back. The Cheney exemption okay. and the energy, when was that? Oh, oh, seven, oh, oh seven, five, something. Yeah. Yeah. Look up the Cheney amendment. Yes, yeah. yes. And basically, that exempts this process from oh, most oh, federal oh. regulations. Mm -hmm. But even when you prove your groundwater is contaminated and you can no longer use your house or garden, you know, water your plants mm -hmm. with your well. Can I just ask, has there ever been an instance where a population gathered and, and expressed their opinion and it even slowed them down? New York. It was New York. New York. York. Yeah. It, it, well, not it, the whole state changed. Said that it, it's up to the community to vote, and if they vote, you can't come here to frack. It's they're out. So that and that, that the last happens. couple of weeks. So Karen, I think what you're saying. I'm not in connection with the New York group and in correspondence with them. Okay, so so uh, what Michelle and Abby Bishop from the conservation group has recommended on the PowerPoint is what we can do now: push for the strongest fracking rules possible by setting the mine and the energy commission here. You know, it's difficult for us to get out of these mountains. You know, it's always a long way to travel. Uh, but, um, and then collecting and sending in the postcard petitions right now, talking to your neighbors. Um, but in these days, um, we, we need to show people that we're not just going to be complacent to have a drill site in our backyard. You know, and preserving our backyard is my whole goal. I have grandchildren. I would like to preserve this area with the waters and lakes and the fresh air. So. I think we need to get the realtors on our side. Okay. Because who's going to buy land that someone's going to crack out there? I think the realtors should be, should be unanimous right. in opposing this. And this push for the strongest fracking rules possible, I think, is. We need to just abolish it. Should it should be a ban. It should be an outright ban. But you know, I saw gasoline two years ago, and, and you know, everything was pending. And I think that um, it's urgent now that it's in people's backyards. And so um, Michelle had said, "Well, it's a little late now." And I said, "Yeah, but what can we do now?" All right, it's two years later. They pushed the act through. 
and um, broken promises, basically. Um, you know, um, you know that they're going to have this happen no matter what. So um, here's another thing: sign a no fracking petition and check the e action alerts box. Visit the conservation network and then follow them on social media, Twitter, and Instagram. And what we need to do is get people on the move. People in New York did, were not complacent. Uh, they ended up doing a very good job. So I think North Carolinians um, need to be educated in what is happening and how they can protect their land and their families. So. Um, I went to a fracking meeting earlier this week in Jackson County at the library and Dr. Potter gave a presentation on the effect to our health and someone who was behind me said that in Macon County at the August uh, Commission meeting there are speakers coming to speak to the commissioners and that it would be good if as many of us as could would show up at this next commissioner meeting. Do you know what day that is? Uh, I think it's the 12th. It's a, the second Tuesday um, of the month. That's a good point. I know Susan. Could, 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 I, 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 read, I heard about this meeting from the little thing in the Frankfurt Press. Could you possibly, somebody, get that meeting and this information that Bradley's going to be discussed and anybody that's against it to show up to put it in the newspaper and might get for people to hear about it? Well, um, uh, is that yes, do. <laughs> um, I think that we as citizens need to do as much as we can do. So, yes. Let me uh, make, go ahead. Yeah, so. um, yeah just. Um, I mean, if fracking happens in this county, this will be an economic and just plain dead zone. Because once the air is polluted, once the water is polluted, that's it. The, the, there is no unpolluting the underground water. And, right. You know, the, the things we saw in the local newspaper were talking about, you know, they have a little diagram of these are the layers of rock, and you know, here's the groundwater, and down here's the shale. Well, in the mountains, it's all of this. We're not doing straight layers. The mountains are all pushed up. There's layers doing this, that, and other thing. And, and the, the, the chance of uh, contamination is much, much higher. I mean, and, and Gasland, too, I, I saw that in the last, I don't know, two months or something here. And what impressed me versus Gasland 1 was that they're not just putting one or two or six wells in. Uh, I mean, they, they showed aerial shots looking down out west and even some it's just it's just like buckshot uh, not buckshot but uh, birdshot it's just they're putting these wells everywhere they don't do three or six they put in hundreds and just by the law of, 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 of averages but also just that many you know they're going for efficiency and when you're doing that many there's a certain percent of, of well casings that are going to fail the cement surrounding the pipe and then then that underground, you know, not just the water and the sand, but the chemicals and the methane are leaking up uh, through the, the cracked casing, the cement, which is what we saw in Deepwater Horizon and the big leak in the, in the Gulf, getting into the groundwater. And once that's contaminated, it's forever. There is no solution. There is no amount of money that you can uncontaminate. You know, and so when they're talking about they're going to do maybe some test drilling in Topton or in Burning Town or or someplace in Nantahala uh, to see what the viability is, economic viability is of, of drilling there. And if you put a well down that deep that gets all the way down into that, there is a possibility it will be into the groundwater. Is, is there a plan for subsurface exploration in the western part of the state? The only thing I've seen was running along the road cuts and grabbing up I'm not it's sure. Rock, which is phenomenal. It, it's it's mainly on public land so far, right? That's where the studies are going to be on public land. But they are planning on doing subsurface? Uh, that's what my understanding is, yeah. But, you know, they're going to be studying first whether it's feasible. Then I don't know what happens after that, you know, once the studies are completed. But, you know, if they're already saying that there's not enough gas to even mess with, why are they even doing the study? You know, 
Well, that's a good question. If they're collecting along the road cuts, that means the only thing they could possibly see is that's the right. surface stuff. Yeah. It will be which is road exactly road. what you don't want to do. Well, the, the law gave the uh, mining companies the right to public domain throughout the state of North Carolina. Then I guess that's the law we have to change. And this begins in August, so I wanted to remind you that it, um, it says that as early as August, um, it will begin collecting rocks in the geological tests. It will be done in uh, Clay, Cherokee, Graham, Halo, Jackson, and Kingsland County. So I think it's important that we show up at these town meetings and, uh, and have a voice. Please uh, take the postcards and begin to pass it on that this is a serious thing for residents of Macon County. Yeah. Not to discourage all potential lines of attack on this thing, but the key right now is in the rulemaking. Uh, it's changing the legislature, changing the legislators yes. who are sponsoring this thing, number one. That's the only way to get the law changed. The most effective line of attack is to tie up the ruling mm -hmm. because that's that's where the action is right now. I agree, and, and, we, need to, and right. we need to like support Bob Scott because they are considering, yes. you know, um, trying to make it where they can't come in right now into this area, even though it's against the law in North Carolina, but mm -hmm. like the other counties, uh, like Webster, to try and keep these people out for a time until we can get this act changed. Legislators, and legislators, minds change. We should take the book. We should take the page from the book against that they use against abortion rights, and that is they're not making abortion illegal. They're just making it so it can't happen. They're throwing a wrench in the works. If yeah, there exactly. are many different ways you can stop this. Just you know, maybe, maybe maybe the water pollution standards. Maybe, maybe you can say all that water polluted water. Uh, we have standards on water pollution. Maybe that is an attack. You know, the chain, the chain law completely subverts that. So I would suggest um, please talk to your neighbors, your family, and. Um, Take as many postcards as you like. I have 500. Uh, they're willing to send many more. Um, and um, attend your town meetings. Attend um, any of these um, if you can. Or if there is a group that wants to go to um, Raleigh, Stanford, or Beesville, they are thinking about starting, uh, seriously looking in Leeds, North Carolina. So um, this is this is not just happening to make it yeah. One, one quick last note. Ronnie Deal has been talking to Jim Davis, and they're trying to get here in Western North Carolina also. Mm -hmm. Those are all the stuff being centered around the, what they're saying is high potential fracking zones. But there's nothing scheduled for, North, for Western North Carolina now. But Ronnie Deal is working on getting some hearings out here on the fracking issue. Does that make it happen or not make it happen? Make it happen. Uh, here. Well, this is to get public input. No, to get the right. money and energy commission to come There's, out. A, there's another day I want to turn off that people probably don't know about, but we're working on this event right now. And it's, it, it's going to be a rally at the uh, Veterans Memorial Shelter at the Rec Center, you know, down 441. Uh, and this is going to be uh, a kind of a follow up event tomorrow, Monday, in, in August in Asheville, and uh, there's going to be a fair amount of outside people coming in from this region because I think fracking is not a Macon County issue, it's a regional issue. And this is a rally, uh, and fracking will be addressed at this, and it's August 23rd, Saturday, and this may also possibly be the day that the governor will be in frack month. Very good information. This, yeah, we're not quite sure about this, but we, we're pretty sure that there's going to be a major event that he's attending in frack month. And, we have, yeah, that's and so we have scheduled this rally to coincide with, and I think people need to be, to let them know, not just through letters, but physically. Physically present. You know, so yeah. that they can see that people are concerned about this. And frankly, it's only one of the issues that will be addressed on that day. 
voting suppression is another issue that's you know pretty big in this country. Yeah. Uh, question: um, do you, Are you putting together an email list, or can we get? You, can you email me the, the PowerPoint that kind of thing? I can. And um, this is the information. Uh, you can contact um, the conservation group uh, on Facebook and Twitter. Also, um, Sally Morgan, Energy and Water Justice, uh, CWFNC.org. CWFNC.org. That, this is another one. Oh. That you can, it's called frackfree.org. Uh, that's a good sign. Can we sign up to get on your email list of his stuff? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I would be happy to send you the PowerPoint. Okay. Um, they sent it to me. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. So, I guess we need to sign up for the back on the back of the piece of paper or give you our email address? Um, yes, you mm-hmm. can do that. And I'll just give you a piece of paper. I'll leave it at the back. And you feel free to sign up and I'll email you and send you this PowerPoint. Anything else? I know we're a little short, I mean, but I just kept the room for two hours. I thought it would be good. I went to the uh, to the dean's office and asked about mineral rights, and the fellow there said it was very uncommon for people to sell their mineral rights in this area. It just wasn't considered to be anything of value under this land. And people didn't realize it was in a reason to. Except we did have extensive micromining back during World War II. Mm-hmm. And it was needed for electronics, but uh, that's pretty much it. And if you bought your property, you pretty much own it. And uh, according to the fellow, uh, some years back, maybe about a decade ago, there was legislation passed saying that any of these old uh, uh, property rights uh, contracts were invalid. They're no longer valid. So, you don't need to worry too much about somebody owning what's on your land. Yeah, but they're going to be drilling. If that happens, it's on public land, which could which could affect you, you know, in indirectly. And public land has well, managed for policy. There's forced yeah. pooling. There is. Right. Well, forced yeah. pooling is the yeah, it, And that is part of the fact. And like I said, it's um, it's on this paper. I don't want to just read all of it to you, but you can. Um, uh, look, uh, take this home with you and, and look at it and um, I think it will affect you I think if they do go underground they dig and then they can get a lot of entry into your property I just want to thank you for the time you spent at organizing yeah. <laughs> you're a really good model for all of us to not think somebody else is going to handle this it boils down to each of us trying to do whatever we can and also next Thursday, I think we're going to be at Mad Batter and Pilgrim, the new um, restaurant theater there. And I think it's Triple Spread or something. It's a video they're showing. It's going to be shown in Asheville. And also, my husband has a petition going to the commissioners. It's whitewater6, the numeral 6 at gmail.com if you want to sign that petition. Um, Karen, you don't have that along, do you? Thank you. There's one other place folks need to be looking. The Forest Service is revising their management plan for Nantahala and Pittsburgh National Forest. One of the places to get into this is to press those guys to ban subsurface mineral exploration. And that will cut it off in the National Forest if you can get that into the management. Is it not already banned? Well, the They're National saying? Forest should be separate from the state, isn't it? I mean, it's under control of the federal government mm-hmm. instead of state. The state cannot uh, sign for any contracts to be done on federal property. Right. Now, federal, it has to all go through federal means to be mm-hmm. done on federal property, which all the Nantahala National Forest is just that, federal property. Right, but the management plan dictates the use of that property. That's right. And if it's it's allowed in the management plan, then it opens the thing up. Right. Okay. But the summer of mine, I think that they that somehow Obama or something in the feds have suggested that all public lands be open for fracking. Wow. Which was a major surprise. That would be horrible. Wow.
Right. I just can't imagine the parade of huge, heavy trucks going up and down uh, Wyatt Ball, right. uh, et cetera, et cetera, in our back rooms. Or on your account. Um, for the oil and gas industry that continues to fight solar components. So there is, we do, as humans, we do have an alternative. We can find other ways to feed our homes and that kind of thing. Um, and the money is going to be kept. Yeah. So, we can also <laughs> Or any groups that have an alternative yeah. energy.